episode of the Match Lip Podcast. My name is Frank Angeloni, and on today's show, we're going to be talking to Jennifer from Atomic Empire. But before we get into that, I wanted to give you a brief breakdown of our previous episode with Paul Butler from Games and Stuff out in Baltimore, Maryland. And if you haven't listened to that episode, you can go and do so now. But what I would like to do is first bring on Jennifer to the show to talk about Atomic Empire. Jennifer, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure to have you on. So if you could tell us a little bit about Atomic Empire's origin and how you got involved in the industry to start off, we could start off with with that discussion. Sure. Um, Atomic Empire has a little bit of a different origin story, I think, than most game stores. my then boyfriend and I were both computer science people uh, in the early 2000s in the Raleigh Durham area. And we were both big gamers. We were into uh, board games, role playing games, a little bit of magic, like did everything. And he's a huge comic book collector. So he was uh, employed in a tech startup. And I was finishing college when the tech crash happened in like 2002 here in this area. And after hopping a couple of companies right before they went under, he got laid off uh, one summer. And I said, hey, for a little bit of extra cash, why don't you sell some of those comic books that are duplicates in your collection? Because he had been buying a lot of comics on eBay to fill in holes, and you ended up with like scads of extras that were just duplication. So we did. We put them all on eBay, and they were insanely successful, which surprised us. And then we started driving around buying up collections to part out on eBay, basically. This became like a tidy little business over the course of a year. And then we said, well, this eBay thing is a hassle. We should open a website because we have the chops to develop one. So we did. (laughs) And it was just a snowball effect because once we had the back issues on the website, we said, well, we should really be offering subscriptions for new comic books. And then we realized that the comic book, the big comic book distributor, Diamond Comics, had a sister uh, distributor called Alliance Games that did games. And normally you couldn't get an Alliance account without a brick and mortar store. But because we already had a Diamond account, we were kind of grandfathered in. And we then started adding games to the inventory because we were huge gamers. And so it was just one of those one thing leads to another thing. And so the next thing we knew, we were in e-commerce fulfillment. Um, so it wasn't until 06, I mean, the whole time, we, we launched the website in June of 2003. And Mark, who by then was my fiance, probably, <laughs> kept saying, we need to open a store. I want to have a game store. And I kept saying, as the, the uh, narrow-minded business person, like, that seems unlikely to be successful. That's a huge commitment. It's going to be expensive. Retail is dying. Um, and one day in, like, 2006, Mark found this little hole-in-the-wall, terrible Class C retail space. And it was not much more expensive than what we were currently paying for a warehouse. And I said, well, there sure doesn't seem like a lot of risk there. So we moved into the store, brought the warehouse with us into a back room of of the store, and we called it Sci-Fi Genre Comics and Games, which was a a terrible name. (laughs) Nobody can pronounce it, and nobody can spell it. Um, So at that point, we... Uh, expanded the website system that we had to support a retail point of sale system. And we hired a bunch of staff and we learned how to run a retail store. Um, And so those first few years were kind of an adventure. Uh, And then around 2012, it was clear that our little class C retail space where we shared, um, shared the building with our landlord, who was a locksmith, And it was this like small gravel parking lot with sort of a mud bog out back that we always had gamers parking in. We realized like we just couldn't grow in that space anymore. There was nowhere to park and we were out of table space. And again, we kind of happened onto a a real estate deal right around the corner where there was um, somebody splitting up an old Ashley furniture and they were willing to section off 12,000 square feet of it for us. And we said, well, we can't take this name with us because it's, it's quite past its expiration date. So we um, rebranded into Atomic Empire at the time of that move. And that's where we've been since 2012. So definitely an unorthodox way of getting into like the retail space. With, and neither of you had any background in, in doing a retail store before or in the games. This, this all kind of just came about. So how did you decide who was going to do what? at that point in time when you, you know, eventually moved, rebranded, how, even in the early portion of it all, how did you decide who was going to do 
what without, you know, the initial background in it. And mostly it's just computer scientists at that point. Um, well, it was a little bit dictated by the fact that for a long time, we couldn't support both of us on what we were making on the business. So Mark, who was, Mark's almost five years older than me. So he had an established career while I was graduating from college. And so he kept the day job to pay the bills and get health insurance up until 2017. So I was kind of the business manager and he helped out a lot on the evenings and weekends, um, writing code and working on marketing and stuff like that. But I was, so, so it just sort of fell out that way. On the development side of things, we're both full stack developers, but Mark kind of specializes um, in front end interactivity and design, uh, CSS, et cetera. And I tend to be a back end systems person. So that's been kind of a cool division of labor because uh, it means we all get our own little playground to, to mess about in, but we can collaborate on bigger projects. That's interesting. And I know we had talked over email, so I wanted to have the chance to talk to you about it here. Was the point of sale system that you guys have, was that something you developed in-house? Yeah. Um, in fact, it's funny because, of course, it started as an e-commerce website. And when we wrote it, uh, when we wrote the website, there weren't off-the-shelf solutions like Shopify and stuff like there are now. You know, this was in the dark ages. And the especially with the complexity of a subscription, a comic book subscription service that had a lot of options that weren't available on other sites, we had to develop everything custom. So then when we decided to open the retail store, we already had this huge inventory system and everything, and we needed the retail point of sale to integrate sort of seamlessly with that. So I remember honestly developing a lot of the retail POS while sitting on the floor in the middle of the store while people assembled racks around me. <laughs> it was a crazy time. <laughs> What was the most difficult aspect of building out the system yourself? What felt like it took the most time or, you know, bugs that came up that, that hindered the process? Payment integrations are always tricky and they were a lot more tricky in 2003. So um, I remember the uh, XML integration with uh, and SOAP integration with places like VeriSign were always really, really tricky to get right. But mostly, I mean, the hardest thing about maintaining the same code base for 20 years is that um, the available technology keeps changing and the sort of best practices keep changing. And you often are looking at these like archeological or geological strata of code, like, oh, this is how we did database connection pooling in 2003. And here's where we layered on this other provider in 2008. And all of that. And so the further back you go in the code of the oldest part of the system, the sort of more antiquated and basic things are. And sometimes you make, you know, back then we made commitments to code patterns that now we kind of regret, but the effort to go back and like rewrite them from the ground up is just, there's not time available for that, right? So I, I'd say that the hardest part is just this, this ongoing beast of this 20 year software system. And how is it working for you at this point? Is it, is it still in development, are you still making updates to it or is it like fully functional and you have it working as you desired it to be? It, it will never be done. <laughs> <laughs> um, like in the last few years, one of our big pushes has been to uh, offer more. So we didn't get into magic singles as a market until maybe the past five years. And so that's been um, an adventure in adding this additional inventory type to the system and then working with our employees who manage that inventory uh, sort of day after day with them saying, oh, you know what this report should really do, or you know how these cards should really be sorted, or here's information I'd really like to have at my fingertips. And so it's just an ongoing iterative process to try to make things more efficient and more accessible for staff and even more easily searchable for customers and improve that experience all the way around. So for your employees, are they entering in cards into the system via like like an admin tool or something like that, that, that interfaces with your point of sale system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are. We have a back end just like you'd have on any point of sale system where inventory management and stuff like that goes on. Okay. And how many employees do you guys currently have? It's in the mid 30s. Oh, wow. So you got a big operation then. It has, again, snuck up on me. You know, it's, I never would have thought that I'd be somebody with 30 some employees, but then you just keep adding positions as it's obvious that you need them because you can't do all the work anymore. And then the next thing you know, you wake up one day and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm almost a medium sized business. 
are they specializing in their own individual aspects of the store? Are they more like, you know, just handling, you know, the cash register and finding people cards or do you have them in different silos? Uh, we definitely have two or three different departments. Um, we have uh, what you'd kind of imagine as the regular retail staff in the storefront who work with magic cards, work with customers, run cash registers, run events, stuff like that. Um, we have an e-commerce fulfillment staff that's dedicated. They're more of a nine to five, um, picking and packing orders, unpacking, receiving, getting things labeled and counted and everything like that. Um, we have data entry folks and customer service folks and, um, and then a kind of a, a amalgam part-time staff that just handles comic book subscriptions every week. Would you say when you realized you needed, you know, more people to do things like as it, as it all snuck up on you, was it hard seeding that control? Cause I know some people have difficulty. They want to do it all themselves, or was it easy for you to give up the reins to have other people take care of certain things? It was really hard at first. I think that the first time I really had to let go was in 2006 when we opened the first store. And it was obvious that I just couldn't be in charge of everything anymore. And I remember my friend Kate telling me, because I was saying, it'll be so hard to teach somebody all of the weird, obnoxious parts of this process, like, and, and how to pay attention to all these things. How am I going to pass on that information? And she said, you have to get over your infatuation with your own expertise. And I was like, wow, harsh, but it was absolutely right. And you, at some point, your growth is limited by being convinced that you're the person who needs to do stuff. That, that's a very fascinating piece of advice. I, like it really made me just think right now as you, were, as you were saying that. And I'm guessing it probably hearing that yourself at the time, you know, it, I'm guessing it helped flesh things out easier for you at that point because you hear that. And then I'm guessing at that point, you're like, okay, then I'll just, just divvy it out how I have to. Yeah, it was helpful to hear. And honestly, at that point in my life, it was helpful to just have somebody tell me something that I that I needed to hear. Like, eventually you get tired of being in charge of everything. It's exhausting and it's draining. And having somebody tell me, you're kind of being an idiot, an idiot right now. Like, get over yourself. <laughs> was very liberating. <laughs> so what is your day-to-day -day then at the store these days? So... Most of my time I spend collaborating with folks. I, we have a, a small, dedicated, long-term, what I, I call them the command staff. They're our department heads or directors. And I spend a lot of time talking to them about the problems that they see or the challenges that we need to solve and how we should solve those things. Um, and then we build processes or we make lists of to-dos for the code. And then when I when I can, I knock those out myself. I really enjoy writing software. And so whenever I get a chance to do that, um, that's a good day. But sometimes it's just about like, okay, what seems to be, what's the friction point? And is it between employees? Is it between employees and customers, between customers and customers, or with our distributors or vendors or other systems, and then trying to facilitate solutions to those problems? So what was your what drew you to code you know and, and writing code yourself and, and development you know i didn't i mean i was always way into computers as a kid um but i i only took my first computer science course in college because i had to have a math requirement and i found out that computer science would do so i was like this is great i don't have to take any math because i'm done with calculus and then i took computer science and said oh Oh, I think maybe I'm very serious about this. And then I had to take a bunch of math. So it was ironic. But I think that what I like about it is that um, it, it, writing software systems is a little bit like writing poetry. Like you want to use as little of it as possible, as few words as possible, to come up with an elegant expression of what you're trying to do that is extensible and maintainable in the future. So I think that computer science has a lot of really interesting challenges and is also very rewarding when you do it right putting all the pieces of a puzzle together, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the difficulties that you were discussing, you know, with, with your team as it relates to whether it be the software, you know, for the point of sale system, or just in general with the store, what are some difficulties you notice on a day-to-day -day that you're working through at the moment that, that other stores may be able to benefit from what you've learned from those challenges and how you've tackled them? Wherever there's contact between people, there is friction. So I think that 
um, one of the things we're constantly working on is communication between between people of all stripes. And so like, for instance, one challenge we're currently working through is that um, our RPG group who plays in the store, D&D Adventurers League, um, things got a little bit hashed up between us and them. There were some miscommunications and they thought we didn't want them around and we thought that they were mad at us. And just facilitating some, you know, our, our events director sitting down with them and, you know, working things through in person. I think that things can get, it's difficult to read code over email or over, uh, I'm sorry, I say code. Difficult to read tone over email or discord. And there's really no substitute for getting face to face with people and saying, you know, how can we help and how can we make this a mutually rewarding relationship? And one mistake I see people make over and over is to get proud about stuff or feel like they need to be right about things. Um, and I think that in order to make good connections with people and build relationships, you need to be able to give up that ego side of it and, and work for solutions and listen to people um, rather than scoring points or being right. You had mentioned communication um, as being something that, you know, may have been missed in that whole scenario you, you just played out and how tone can get lost over whether it be email or discord what is a way that you feel that communication could be improved upon in scenarios like you described or, you know, other scenarios in more of a general sense? Where do you think that practice of communication can be better fostered? I think that transparency is really huge. Um, being honest about the fact that we're a business and that we have marks that we need to hit internally in order to make things successful so that it doesn't I see a lot of game stores or a lot of game store customers act like game stores ought to be like a public service or a charity, right? And I think that we all, it's okay to recognize that at the bottom line end of the day, game stores have to make money to be successful. They have to be able to pay salaries. Um, and so that's a roundabout approach to the fact that I've found it really effective to just square up with people and say, here's our situation. Here's how it is. We can't run this tournament at a loss. We can't give away this product at almost cost. We can't match this online price because it's not realistic for a store that has overhead. And I found that people really seem to appreciate that level of just coming clean about stuff and laying it out. Um, and I, I think that we shouldn't be afraid to talk about economic realities when we, when we talk about our game stores. I think it's a great thing that you do that. It's you know one of the reasons I started the podcast because I wanted players to have a better understanding of what's actually going on behind the scenes of the game store. And it's it's not like you know the scenario where you're wanting to charge you know you know triple a price of something. The overhead does play a very significant role in it. And with the fact that you know game stores typically the margins and stuff are like sealed product, as I've talked about on the podcast before, are low. I wanted to know if you could share some insight into in regards to how the overhead plays into the cost and how what factors you have to take into account when pricing product. Pricing product in a game store is very complicated <laughs> um, because, as you noted, margins are low and players have developed an expectation that prices should mirror what they are uh, going rate online, which often... Straight from the distributor, um, a product might come in at only like 10% below what it's going for on TCG Player, which is just not enough to, you know, to keep the lights on in a game store. Um, so we, because we started online, we always had a really awkward relationship with pricing because online we have to compete with online prices. But in the store, offering those prices doesn't keep the lights on. And I think that what we generally try to do is offer a low enough price on things that people can see them on the shelf and say, I can pay that price to support my local game store. But that is usually a price that's under MSRP and a lot of stores can't operate with that margin. You know, we have um, a lot of revenue coming in through the website and that helps prop up the store. And I know that a lot of stores don't have access to that kind of secondary outlet. When it comes to the pricing for the website, do you operate that as you did prior to the retail store? So is that more of the competing for the, from an online standpoint? Yeah. Um, I would say that having a retail store has moderated what we do with our online pricing because we want to match our online prices in the store all the time. 
So we have, I would say that our prices are, are set so that they can be um, in many cases competitive online, but we're never going to be the bargain basement lowest uh, while also still providing enough margin in the store to, to make that feasible. Understood. And from the store standpoint, you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you're able to offer product pricing in the store under MSRP, which you mentioned, and as we know, a lot of stores can't do that. Is that purely based on the volume that you order in, or is there other factors that play into that? I think it's mostly about efficiency and the fact that um, having that online revenue uh, really, really helps with cash flow and just keeping things going. We generally offer about 20% off on new board games and trade paperbacks, uh, new product in general. Um, obviously, pricing on things like Magic is more complicated because it's a very competitive market and there's no MSRP. Um, we really appreciate manufacturers that have a minimum advertised price because it makes pricing easy and it uh, standardizes things. And I think it protects the value of the product in many cases. So like, for instance, Asmodee board games always have a minimum advertised price and that's generally the price we sell at. Okay. And how do you overcome from the profit standpoint, those low margins that are typically seen in a game store? What types of um, ways do you address that? It is just a hard business and there's no way to, to sugarcoat it or make it easier. Um, some months we're not profitable because it doesn't, the problem is that when you're dealing with razor thin margins, it doesn't take much going wrong, like a botched pre-release to just wipe out anything you were going to make. So for instance, our, um, wild Devel drain pre-release product showed up the Monday after the pre-release. And that was a tough month for us because we depend on, you know, when, when you're dealing with razor thin margins, things mostly have to go right. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I'm not sure I would say we mitigate it. I mean, I, I would say that running a game store is a little bit like strapping yourself onto a bull and letting them open the chute and every day you're just trying to hang on. No, it, I, I definitely can understand from, yeah, as I've mentioned, from the other stores I've spoken with, I've heard of a lot of similar stories. I know it's a constant daily struggle with, you know, trying to balance everything and, and keep it all intact. I'm guessing it's the reason, you know, anybody would do anything. I'm guessing it's, it's, it's purely a love for you at this point. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, obviously I love games and I love gamers and I've been in business, I guess, 20 years now, and I'm still just so impressed with our community, um, how they come together and how they are passionate, but also it's nice to be in charge of your own destiny. And there are times I've thought I really should have going to work for Google, I really should have gotten the corporate job because I wouldn't have these fears all the time. And some of these frustrations, you know, you're always hanging out here by yourself on the end of the cliff. But at the same time, um, I, I'm kind of the pilot of my own ship and I get to make a lot of decisions that affect my destiny. And that's really satisfying. That's great to hear. And, and that's something, you know, I think is very admirable too, because what you're doing is, you know, a challenge, not just from the low profit margin standpoint, but from also managing something of your own and being, you know, having nobody above you to go to because you are the top person. So with that in mind, how do you deal with that on, on a day-to-day -day basis, knowing that you're the one that has to make the decision? I know you had mentioned you like being in charge of your own destiny, which is absolutely fantastic. But I'm curious, once you go away from that standpoint, how do you, with essentially nobody really to be like, oh, let me go talk to my boss about X, um, that you have to make the decision. How do you handle that? Mostly you get used to it. And 20 years in, you know, you start with the small decisions and 20 years in when you're signing a 10 year lease, you just, it, some of the, some of the anxiety has shined off of it. But also I think that, um, I think I've been really lucky to have a hobby that has nothing to do with the store. And I see a lot of folks where gaming is their main, their main way of decompressing and then they get into the gaming business and it takes kind of the, the fun out of gaming and it makes it so they can't completely disconnect. And I think that for any job that's going to be kind of high anxiety, high pressure like that, it's really important to have an outlet that is just completely different and takes you away from it so that you can really put your brain on hold for a little while and, and step away. Absolutely. And you had mentioned regarding the events 
uh, you touched on it a tad earlier with the pre-releases, like for Wild Devil Drain. Is that typically for a game store and, and yours in particular, is that typically the most profitable event or are there other events you also hold that, that do carry the same amount of weight as say a pre-release would? It's hard to beat a magic pre-release. Um, Wizards kicks in prize support. Uh, it's the only way for people to, to play the game on paper that early. And so we get um, a lot of folks who come out to have a good time. I'd say that I'd say it's very hard to meet, beat a Magic pre-release or a Pokemon pre-release for for revenue generation and profitability. Do you find that newer players come to those pre-releases more often, or do you get a lot of returning players uh, attending them as well? Um, both. I'd say it has a strong draw for both new players and returning players, and it tends to be a casual atmosphere where people people come out to have a good time, and people at pre-releases because it's uh, sort of a less competitive market are are not as concerned with EV or making money playing the event and that kind of thing. They mainly expect to come out, spend money, get some cards and, and have a good time. And what types of steps are you taking to bring new players into the store? That's one thing that I think is a weakness for us. Um, we are not great at outreach and we kind of rely on word of mouth and having been around for as long as we have to, uh, to reach people. I don't, honestly know how people get into magic as much anymore um, because I'm not kind of on the front lines of converting new players. But I know that like at elementary schools, there's magic clubs and we, you know, work with them sometimes. And we, we try to make sure that people, when they do get into hobbies that are related to the store that we, that they know that we're here. So since word of mouth is definitely a good marketing option for, for getting the word out about the store, what were you doing in the earlier days when the store was newer to get those people in, in the door to start building that initial customer base that turned into loyal players? So this is, this is a funny story, actually. I mean, to answer your question, honestly, we did a lot of conventions, um, which I don't miss at all because it was just exhausting work. Um, but... Uh, when we first opened, there was drama because a store um, maybe 15 miles away from us closed the same week that we opened. And we hired the manager that they laid off when they closed. And the rumor around the magic circle was that we were responsible for that store's demise, that we had poached their manager and it was the last straw for them and they went under, which was completely not the right narrative. Um and we actually got kind of blackballed by the magic community for probably the first six months we were open and we couldn't get anything going. And there were two players who came out every Friday night and they sat in the game room and they brought some decks with them and they played magic together. And for a long time, we were like, magic's just not going to go here. Like, I don't know how to get it started. Uh, we, we've been kind of cut out of that and... And I don't know what we're going to do, but these two guys came out every Friday. And then sure enough, one other person would show up and disappear again. And then two more people. And it was the dogged participation of these two folks who made sure that if somebody else did come out for Friday Night Magic, there would be games to play and there were decks to play with and all of that. And that sort of grassroots um, dedication to getting a community going is, I think, make or break for, for young game stores. They became like your ambassadors for the store. They, they really were. So speaking of games, what are some of your favorite games to play? Oh, I love Dominion, which is really going to age me. Um, I love Agricola. I'm, I, I'm like, I, my sweet spot is in intellectual strategy games that take less than two hours. <laughs> and forgive me, are these board games? Yes. Sorry, I jumped straight into board games. Yes, they're Euro games. Deck builders and resource management and worker placement games is kind of my jam. But I also am a big D&D gamer. Um, and I have, played, I have played enough Magic to be a game store owner. I'm, like, I enjoy a pre-release and I like to sit down and play Popper or something, but I have not gotten into collecting. So you mentioned Popper. That's one of my personal favorite formats. Do you guys hold that at your store? We do. We have a small but enthusiastic popper crowd. And what are the numbers like for that? Because I'm always curious what a store does to try to get, um, you know, I guess hype, you could say, around that format. Because I know some stores can't fire it off at all. Others have a, a decent sized turnout. I was curious what it's like from your side. I think it's about eight to 16 players. 
And I think we run it about once a month on Friday Night Magic, or we'll hold a Saturday tournament for it. We don't we don't try to make it run every week, but um, as an occasional treat, it seems to get some traction. Okay, that's very cool. And in terms of some other events, what are some of the other events you hold at the store that are popular amongst the the player base? Uh, we have a great Games Workshop community uh, for Warhammer and um, Age of Sigmar. Um, you know, honestly, our most popular event of the year is we hold a semi-annual geek garage sale where you can reserve a table and come out and everybody buys, everybody who visits the store buys raffle tickets at a dollar a piece. And then they can buy the things at your sort of garage sale table uh, for the raffle tickets. And then you turn your raffle tickets in at the end of the day for store credit. So it's a way, it's like a swap meet to get rid of your old board games and get new board games or new cards or what have you. And it, it, the tables sell out instantaneously every time we open registration. Everybody just seems to have an amazing time. Like I, I think honestly, that's kind of our flagship event from a community standard. That's really neat. I mean, I haven't heard of a store doing that before. Would you say that's probably your most popular thing that it, you hold? It is. It is huge, and everybody just seems to love it. And we're always getting questions like, "When's the next garage sale?" I've got all these board games. <laughs> <laughs> You kind of beat me to it because one of my questions for you was going to be a unique selling point of the store. And I would definitely classify that as one of them. Is there anything else that you would put under that that title? Uh, we have draft beer on tap, like local microbrews, which I think is a lot of fun. And we, we, often, we often say the place is huge. Like I think that the comment we get most often when people come in and they're like, oh, wow, is I had no idea this place would be so big. I had no idea you'd see so many players. And we just, because we're backed by the the e-commerce business to some extent, we can carry a really big inventory. And so we have a huge breadth of product. So I think that it's kind of fun for people to walk in and just see the overall range of games and comics and nerdy stuff that's available and just kind of get immersed in that. We're going to take a quick break from this podcast to talk about our sponsor, Cardboard Shuffle. Cardboard Shuffle was our 10th podcast interview here at The Match Slip with store owner Mark. Mark has expanded his brand and has produced his own card sleeves called Shuffle Shields. Shuffle Shields come in packs of 100 premium matte card sleeves for standard size trading cards. They contain no PVC and are acid free. I have 17 packs of Shuffle Shields card sleeves to give away to listeners of the podcast and followers of the Match Slip on social media. Requests for a free pack of card sleeves shipped for free to you will be processed on a first come first serve basis. To receive your free pack of Shuffle Shields, you'll need to send a screenshot that you're following Cardboard Shuffle on Facebook to frank at thematchlip.com. Good luck, and back to the episode. What's the square footage of the store? Um, it's 12,000 square feet overall, and I want to say 2,500 to 4,000 of it is warehouse. Uh, it's about The game room is about 2,500 square feet, and back in the day, we used to be able to seat over 200. Um, back when like uh, mad, like states t- state championship tournaments and stuff were a thing, we we could seat two hundred Magic players. Oh wow, that's that's quite the turnout. And what are what are the turnouts average these days? They're lower, you know. Um, a pre-release might run a hundred to one hundred and twenty people sometimes. Those are big ones, but I think post COVID. Uh, people are just into less density. And so we've actually thinned out the tables in the game room to provide like a sort of more roomy, comfortable atmosphere rather than trying to pack more people in. And I think that that's, I think post COVID, that's what people are more comfortable with. And it just provides a better, better user experience for everybody. Sure. Yeah, no, it's understandable. In terms of the beer, because that really piqued my interest. How did that start with the store? Did you have to get like a liquor license or anything to do that? Or was there something else involved that brought that into the store? Because it seems like it would be a good way to um, add additional revenue um, to offset the low profit margins for like Magic product, for example. Mm -hmm. So when we were moving to the bigger store, Mark and I said, you know what would make us spend more time in the store is if we could game and drink beer at the same time. And so we started looking into it. The ABC licensing process in North Carolina is kind of harrowing. It's There's a lot of stuff you have to do. And um, 
in, it, you have to, you know, at the time you had to go take a class in person in Raleigh to get certified and everything. And so, and, and I remember sitting down with a zoning person in Durham City and saying, trying to explain what a game store was and why people would be hanging out and drinking beer. And I'm like, okay, so imagine like 50 of your closest friends playing Monopoly. And while they're sitting around their Monopoly boards, it was a hysterical conversation. Um, and inevitably, they, like eventually they did approve us and we were able to bring the beer in. And you'd be surprised. It seems like a really high margin kind of operation, but the liability insurance to cover alcohol sales is really expensive and kegs are expensive. And there's a lot of waste also, you know, you, you pour out a little beer for every beer you pour. Um, kegs go bad occasionally, stuff like that. So it, it's not it's not a huge revenue generator like you'd think. Also, competitive Magic players don't drink while they play. Warhammer players do drink while they play. So we've kind of now got this idea of like which communities are heavy beer consumers and which communities are like, no, 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 I need to be sober. This is a serious business. I would have never have thought that until you said it about the difference between you know a competitive Magic player versus casual. In terms of those two types of players, what do you find more at your store? Are they more casual? They're more competitive. We have a more competitive, I'm sorry, a more casual player base. And I think that that's been kind of intentionally cultivated by us. Um, there are other stores in the area that do a better job of catering to a competitive atmosphere, but we feel like our bread and butter is those commander players, tabletop magic players who, who want to come out and have a good time. And commander, I would assume, is probably the most popular event it is. And that's been kind of a slow transition over the last 10 years, but we can't get anyone at all to play standard. And modern used to be really, really strong for us, but I think the format got a little bit stale and card prices keep going up. And so right now our commander night is just hopping every, every week. From a store standpoint, because I've heard this from a number of game stores of commander essentially overtaking from a magic standpoint, the, the, majority of the play how does that play into the store side of things because when i think about a, a game store and you know the competitive scene in terms of you know whether it be an rcq event or any type of you know a store championship and with standard not being what it was and modern like you were mentioning you said you were seeing it not as popular due to the format being stale what type of a role does that play in events for a game store if commander is the only thing is, is that a negative impact or or is it a, has been has it been a positive it's just it just requires a different approach and i think that uh we're not alone in that we haven't quite figured out how to cater to that player and make that something that makes the store go you know um because when you have a modern player, you charge an entry fee and there's, you know, there's a tournament format and commander is really best played in a casual format. And once you start trying to make it competitive and you start issuing prizes, then it can get nasty and toxic. Right. So, um, so I think that like, I don't see it as a problem or, or bad for the store or events, but I think it's an opportunity that everybody's still trying to figure out how to make the most of, right. How to, how to realize its potential. Is there any, from a financial standpoint, a benefit? Because I, I know commander players will buy a lot of cards since you know the decks are a hundred cards a piece. I'm curious from a financial standpoint for the store, is that is is that a boon for the store? It is, yeah. Commander players buy a ton of singles because they they're building stuff all the time, and a lot of times their decks aren't very expensive, so they're able to cycle through them faster than you know a standard player would who might have seven hundred dollars in a deck. Um, so from that perspective, it's really cool. Also though, some of those low price magic singles, if you don't have really efficient people doing fulfillment on them, you're, you're picking a hundred card order for 25 cent cards and you have to start looking at the labor cost of that and whether that's really profitable. And I think that that's something that when you're doing a lot of volume in something, it's sometimes hard to, hard to see the forest for the trees as far as whether that thing that you're really busy doing is actually profitable or not. And I have not gotten deep into the numbers on it, to be honest. Okay. So do you know how many like card orders you're getting in a given day that you guys are having to process? It's funny. I was just talking to our store manager, Josh, about this the other day. And he said, it's wild, the ebb and flow of the card orders. Um, because Wednesday at lunch, we might get 25 orders and then nothing on Sunday. Right. So um, it seems to me like we're processing uh, 
at least like 20, 30 orders a day, I think on average. Okay. And are you guys open seven days a week? We are. We are open 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. on the weekdays, um, 10 to 10 on Saturday and 12 to 6 on 11 to 6 on Sunday. Very cool. And I wanted to get your thoughts on something. The reason I ask is because I've heard some other stories say that, you know, Mondays are one of the slower days in the gaming industry. And I was curious with you being open seven days a week, if you felt the same thing on your end or if it's, it's, or, or it's consistent on your side. Yeah, that is consistent. Um, We do oddly get a big surge of card orders overnight into Monday. So we have a lot of card picking to do on Monday, but Monday night in the game room has always been the slowest. And I think it's just a result of as people get back to their work week and they're kind of getting back on the horse and getting their life together, they have less time for recreation. And then later in the week, you know, Thursday, Friday, everybody's ready to take some time off and blow off some steam. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So what do you feel is one thing we've talked about some of the struggles What's one thing you feel or a couple of things that you feel is working really well for the store right now? I think Pokemon is actually going very, very well for the store right now. I think it, we, our community is very young and, you know, it's kids getting into gaming. And I think that by keeping things mostly really casual in that community, we're giving parents a little break on Sunday afternoon when we run our our Pokemon league and also giving kids that introduction to social play and, all of those things that go along with being a good community member. Is Pokemon very popular in North Carolina? Because from my standpoint, growing up here in, in New York, on Long Island in particular, Pokemon was always one of those things where I would see people buying the cards growing up, and but nobody ever played. But it seems to be it's something that's um, quite played in, in North Carolina. It is. We have a really healthy player base of Pokemon players. And we run everything up from, you know, we have our casual league and then we run the uh, league cups and the challenges and stuff like that as those are awarded. And we see, so we seem to get players across the spectrum from casual to competitive. Very neat. At least, at least it has, you know, a wide array of different types of play styles, depending upon what you want to go with. And where in North Carolina are you guys located? I see on the website, it says Durham. I know you were referencing rally before. I was curious in, in terms of proximity of uh, where you guys might be located to, to get a better idea. Yeah, we're, we're in the Piedmont in the middle of the state. We are, Durham is, um, part of the research triangle, uh, Raleigh, Durham and Chapel Hill. So we are surrounded by universities, research institutions, hospitals, and, and stuff like that, which I think has made it a really good area to have a game store in because there's a lot of people who are, who are geeks. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And do have you benefited, would you say from, the schools in the area, like coming to the store, like you see, like maybe a, a, every four years, a new cycle rotation of players. You would think so, but actually it's a little bit difficult to get Duke and UNC students to leave campus. Um, they, they don't have great access to transportation a lot of times. And so what we really see as a result of those nearby universities is staff and uh, faculty and support people who are in or research folks who are involved in those institutions, but not necessarily as much the students. And what made you choose this particular spot in North Carolina to host, to be the host of the game store, like to, to say, okay, we're going to move Atomic Empire here. What was, what was that decision based on? This is where we lived. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say it was a really, you know, well thought out decision involving maps, but there wasn't a, a, a game store in Durham. When we opened, we had, um, there were stores not far away in Chapel Hill and Raleigh, but Durham seemed like, like a town that could use a store and we already had our warehouse here. And, and so, you know, it was only a 10 minute drive from home to work. Okay. So it was distance that played a factor into it. I wasn't sure if it was something like there was something particular you liked about where, you know, say the shopping center was located or what was in the Mm. vicinity that you thought might draw people to the store. You know what? Um, The only factor we had in looking for retail space was price Uh, because I, because with the amount of square footage we need, high rent was not on the table. So in both cases, when we moved into stores, it was because we found, we found an offer we couldn't refuse on real estate. Do you feel from the first location to the location you're currently in now, was it 
more expensive to move as you know, or was it cheaper at the previous location? It was much cheaper at the previous location. Um, but with the move to the new location, we got almost infinite parking because we're in a, a strip mall with a huge parking lot and more visibility, um, to the main road and everything were less off the beaten path. So it was definitely a worthwhile upgrade, but, but the price was intimidating when we signed that lease and we had to wonder, you know, we've always told ourselves like, if we build it, they will come, but we definitely put our butts on the line with the move to the bigger space that we, we had to make it work. And we had to hope that, that what we saw as the potential of these growing player bases, being able to fill out that parking lot and fill that game room, that that would come true. And how is the foot traffic being in a, in a strip mall? Do you notice people casually, you know, coming in that might return again? Or is it not like that, like in, in the particular area you're in? Uh, we've always considered ourselves a, a destination location. Um, we don't get foot traffic in our shopping center. It's a little older. It's a little dilapidated. And we are um, we have an Asian market on the one side, which is awesome. We go over there for for rolls and stuff. And we have um, a kind of like on again, off again, gym and event center on the other side. So there's not really a lot of opportunity for people to walk by and say, oh, a game store. Um, and so we've always felt like we have to, we have to be the anchor in the parking lot, right? We have to be the people draw drawing customers in. And how is it being the anchor of a store? I ask because a, another game store that that's been on the program before, Anubis Games, there in Lafayette, uh, Louisiana. He talked to me, um, Darnell, his name is, and he mentioned to me that he didn't want to be the anchor of a store. And I'm curious, since you guys are the anchor of your store, what has that been like and what are the challenges that come with that? I mean, in some ways it's great because I think we don't have a lot of like random shoplifting. We don't have a lot of loitering or anything we need to worry about for the most part. Um, in other ways, like it would be nice if people just wandered by and saw us now and then. Uh, and, but we just, our business is just organized around the fact that we know that we're going to have to survive on the people who come to find us and not the people who, who just happen onto us. And for when somebody's coming to the store, if you were to paint like a, a picture for people listening of, they walk into the front door, what, how would you describe the layout of the store for people listening? We have the retail section up front in the game room further back. The store is narrow and really long, so it's built a little bit like a torpedo tube. Um, so when you walk in, we've got board games and card games all the way down the wall on the right, and then um, the left is miniatures games, CCG supplies and stuff, and the point of sale will be on your left as you enter with um, magic sealed product, etc. behind the counter. Uh, we so then we have a long central aisle down to the game room, so you can see all the way through the store from the front door, but it's a long walk to get back there. And what would are some future plans that you know that you're thinking of? Maybe not now, but maybe down the line that you would like to have happen for the store, whether it be you know more inventory, you know a bigger space, or you know any anything. Even if you know it's something that's more of a of a dream of yours to have for the store, what is something you're you're envisioning for the future? Uh, you know, we were one of the first stores to get an application in for WPN Premium, and we still don't have it. <laughs> um, and so I think it would be a feather in our cap to eventually chase that down. Could you describe a little bit about what that process is like? Sure. Um, it's evolved a lot, and I don't think that we were well served by being one of the first people in the door because I felt like... As that process changed, the expectations also changed. And so I don't want to say it was like a moving goalpost situation, but it sometimes felt like we were chasing a moving target. Um, you, you, these days, I think you fill out an application and submit a video walkthrough of your store. And then there's a review process where one or more reps will give you some things to work on, some things to correct. For us, we actually received one of the grants to upgrade our tables. Um, and some other things in the store. And that was, it was cool that Wizards was giving out those grants to help people make premium. But it's also very challenging for a store of our size to get premium because it's difficult for us to pull off that kind of boutique experience when you're dealing with 12,000 square feet of space and getting everything 
um, ship shape, not having exposed cardboard, you know, no card boxes and stuff like that. We, we got rid of our back issue comic book selection, which it was time for it to go anyway. Um, because, but in, in part that was motivated because wizards really didn't like the, the comic box look on, on the shelves in our, in our comic drawers, um, things like that. And so it, it's, it's a pretty big undertaking, I think, for a store of our size that's been in business as long as we have with the amount of just sort of legacy business that's gone on and reimagining all of that from, <clears throat> from the perspective of making those premium adjustments. This episode of The Match Slip is sponsored by Crash City Con, Roanoke, Virginia's premier gaming and fan convention. It's tabletop gaming at its best in addition to role-playing games, board games, there are vendors, and so much more. Play with some of the top game masters in the area, enjoy a casual game in their open gaming area, or learn to play games you always wanted to play. Attend Crash City Con August 23rd through the 25th of 2024 at the Berglund Center Special Events Center. You could check out more information at CrashCityCon.com. Does the store have any like particular theme to it that Wizards is looking for? I don't know at this point. I know that um, we've we've done a lot of extension of our brand throughout the store, uh, in part because Wizards suggested it, but also it's a good idea. We we did a whole bunch of custom signage in the last year um, to to improve browsability, but also reinforce our branding and and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, bringing in the darker tables sort of uh, increased the uh, classiness quotient, right, versus the sort of cafeteria tables that we used to have. Um, but at this point, I know that what we're looking for is a number of cosmetic adjustments that just take time and money, and it always seems like something else is on fire. That's what I've heard with the WPN premium is it's a lot of upfront cost in order to get approved, and then it's constant rechecking in with them to maintain that status. Mm -hmm. it's, de it's definitely challenging in a big operation. I can imagine. Uh, I hope you do get it. Is, is, there any, is there any word on the horizon that you've received that um, when that may come down the pike? You know, we, we kind of paused during COVID um, chasing that because we ended up, you know, I mean, what a scary time that was for game stores. And we ended up converting a big hunk of our in-store play space at that point to additional e-commerce fulfillment. And so then it was just kind of off the table for the duration. Um, and then as things have come back, uh, we, we, again, we know that we have some of that cosmetic work to do. And I actually just got an email from them this week that said, Hey, we're going to close your application for now, but you know, reapply when you're ready. And so I think right now the goal is in the next year to, to clean up some, you know, uh, instances of bad floor tile and chipping paint and stuff like that, and then make another run at it next year. Okay. Very cool. Well, Jennifer, my last question for you is related to something you touched on earlier, which is something I normally like to ask and, and talk about a little bit, which is related to conventions. And I know you said in the early days that that was something you guys were doing to essentially get the name out of the store, but you're not you know, doing it anymore because of the exhaustion involved with that. Is there anything local you do in terms of conventions still as a, as a marketing uh, tool for the store? You know, we don't, um, partly because it, having done a few of them, our research sort of showed that the people that we meet there already know about us. So we didn't really feel like we were getting outreach to new faces at that point. And it is, you know, even locally loading up a trailer and taking a bunch of the stock away and finding staff who want to work the convention and stuff like that, it's, it feels like it's a detraction from our core mission. Um, rather than, and, and doesn't, you know, because we feel like we already have pretty good penetration in the local market, I don't think there's a lot of return on investment on that effort. That's understandable. Yeah. I know it's different for, for each store, but you felt though in the, in the early days, it was a good driver. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was worthwhile to get out there and shake hands and meet people and remind them that we were opening, you know, we did a lot of stuff right before we opened grand opening kinds of promotions. Um, just to kind of prime that pump and make sure that people know like, Hey, we're, we're here, we're over here, we're brand new, but we're going to, you know, we're going to have your D and D books. We're going to have your magic cards. Stop by and see us. Awesome. And as we wrap up, I just wanted to leave this essentially open floor space for you to share, you know, where people could find you. If there's anything you want to share um, as we close out here about the store or anything about your journey with it. 
Yeah, um, please find us at atomicempire.com and there's a link on the site to our Discord server. We'd love to have new faces in there talking about games and hanging out. Um, if you don't have a friendly local game store of your own, we're happy to be your online source. We're still a small business. You're still supporting somebody's local store. But if you do have a local game store, please shop there because it is so hard to keep these spaces open. These are important community spaces, third spaces. And without financial support, they can't stay open. So we really appreciate everyone who, who shops local and supports their game store. And I'll be sure to put a link to uh, the store uh, website in the, in the show notes for this episode. Jennifer, I want to thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. And for everybody else listening, if you enjoyed the episode, I invite you to subscribe to our newsletter at thematchslip.com slash newsletter, where you could get my reviews of the stores I visit in person and do a full review on. And if you'd like to check that out again, that's thematchslip.com slash newsletter. And with that being said, we'll talk to you all in the next episode. Take care. <laughs>